It's goodbye CRI, goodbye color rendering index. Hello, lighting in the new world of color metrics with the TM30 or technical memorandum 30 standard that's been proposed by the Illumination Engineering Society. So as I mentioned before, this is the most technical we get in our webinar series. So please stick with me. So our story for anyone who doesn't know, we are a manufacturer's rep agency. And what we do is we connect global manufacturers to the local markets. And here at Catalyst, we really have a focus and a why we exist on sustainability. And we're really trying to help achieve that environmental sustainability and personal independence through electrification. And you can see it with the products and the manufacturers that we partner with from LED lighting to solar to electric vehicles. You know, that's really our focus. We believe we're in the right industry for those reasons. And we want to keep perpetuating that growth. So what are the objectives today? Really, this is set up a little differently because it is such a technical presentation. So what are our learning objectives? What do we hope to walk away with? First and foremost, what is TM30? And why was it even developed in the first place? We probably have all used CRI in this industry for a very long time from a specification standpoint, from a selection perspective. So what is TM30 and why was it developed? Comparatives. So if we're comparing this new TM30 to CRI, what are those comparisons? So we want to get a better understanding of that. Then the three components of TM30, very important. CRI is a single metric. TM30 has three components. We really want to get uh, an in-depth understanding of those and how they characterize light. And last will be market impacts. Impact. So how to specify lighting using the TM30 standard, how we select lighting is going to differ once this standard becomes more widely adopted. So without further ado, let's dive into it. And let's really look at our current comparisons. And really every comparison we have in lighting comes from the most important light source we have, which is our very own sun. And it is the closest thing we have to a black body radiator and everything we try to mimic in artificial light is trying to mimic this black body radiator, our sun. So firstly, correlated color temperature or CCT. We're all familiar with that, I'm sure. But essentially correlated color temperature that allows us to reference how warm or cool a light is uh, re with reference to the reference source. So that's when we get into our Kelvins, our 2700 on the warmer side, our 5000 Kelvin on the cooler side. The next reference source we commonly use when specifying or selecting lighting is lumens. And lumens is really a measure of the total quantity of visible light emitted by a source per unit of time. The other reference metric would be lux or what we more commonly use in north america lux is more of a european metric but we use foot candles it's a direct equivalent and really this is measurement of luminous flux per unit of area so how much light is actually falling on a surface both on the horizontal or vertical plane and the last comparison that i'm going to touch on and why we're here today is cri so the color rendering index it's a scale from zero to 100 really as a percentage and it indicates how accurate a given light source so an artificial light source is at rendering the color when compared to that reference source our sun so next we want to dive deeper into cri and really what we want to dive into is why we should stop using it as a comparative what are its shortcomings and really, unfortunately for CRI, CRI should have probably died with the incandescent light bulb. We know the incandescent light bulb has been discontinued in several jurisdictions, cities, countries, um, provinces, but really CRI should have died with that incandescent light bulb because, you know, that source relies on burning something to emit visible light, just like our comparative. Well, there's something that has systemically changed. If we look at all these artificial light sources, and Eli did a phenomenal job a few weeks ago looking at the history of lighting, but if we look at all the artificial light sources up until the LED, and why I left the LED off of this is for an important reason, because if we look at all these artificial light sources from fire to candles to gas burning kerosene lamps to incandescence to halogens to fluorescence, really we're going through the history of that lighting, 
And there's a similarity up until the LED. And that's that all light sources from through these rely on burning filaments and or gas to produce light, essentially the same way that our own sun does by burning something. But CRI doesn't work when we start to get into LED and the way that LED produces light. So there's a, there's a shortcoming with the CRI standard, and that's really why the Illumination Engineering Society and their task force developed the TM30 standard to address that shortcoming. So visually represented, I just want to dive into this a little more on the technical side so we can have appreciation for where CRI is and where TM30 can take us. So visually represented, this is why CRI doesn't tell the whole story. And we don't have to go much further than the electromagnetic spectrum. And as you may remember, we did a, a previous webinar and we referenced the electromagnetic spectrum as imperative. But there was first discovered this spectrum by William Herschel in the 1800s. He was doing temperature experiments with prism. So he was refracting light through a prism, separating it into its primary colors, and was actually measuring the temperatures of each color. And he actually noticed once he moved the thermometer outside of the red spectrum, so where no visible light actually existed on the surface, was the highest temperature. And that's when William Herschel discovered infrared light, but really what William Herschel gave us with discovery of that visible light spectrum and ultimately the electromagnetic spectrum was a spectral power distribution chart where we can actually look at the saturation, so the energy per visible wavelength, as opposed to just the rendering or fidelity. So how many of the colors does that light source produce versus how saturated is that light source. So really, let's look at these three spectral power distribution curves or SPD. Here we have tungsten halogen. I'm just gonna go ahead and grab my laser pointer. Uh, so here on the left, we have tungsten halogen. Here in the centered, we have filtered daylight and then we have LED. So if we look at filtered daylight spectral power distribution and filtered meaning you know it's not passing through clouds it's not a high humidity day it's just filtered clean sunlight probably around the 5500 kelvin range you can see high peaking here in the uh, blue violet spectrum and then it falls off a bit in the red and this is why we'd be at 500 or sorry 5500 kelvin as far as cct goes now let's go over here to tungsten halogen. You can see both of these sources, which would be a 100% CRI, have very different amounts of saturation, but they both produce 100 on the current CRI index. And then we go over to LED and you can see we're missing several wavelengths. Oh, sorry, I just got a pop up about my internet connection. Hopefully it's still good. But you can see we're missing very, several wavelengths and that's the inherent nature of light emitting diodes. They produce close to ultraviolet. We use phosphors to mimic the rest of those visible colors. So from a CRI perspective, LED typically performs lower unless we start working those numbers. And it also doesn't tell us about human preference. Even though LED may rank lower on a single metric CRI, the human eye may have preferences for different versions of that CRI, even though they don't match 100. So right now, specifiers have no way to identify that. So what is TM30? Well, TM30, it's a document, uh, sorry, it's a new and improved method for characterizing color rendering abilities that go beyond where CRI have, has its shortfalls. So it was developed by the IES Color Metrics Task Group, and TM30 is an approved document. You can go on the IES website today, you can download it, you can use it as a best practice, uh, and it can be used immediately. It has not been written, and I just wanna highlight that, and that's one of the um, campaigns that the IES is doing and why they're sharing info like this with, uh, with the industry is because it has not been written into ANSI and ISO standards. And it'll need to be, to really achieve widespread use or to become a standard where manufacturers are required to produce the TM30 values. Although it's not a required standard, it can still be used to improve the engineering and specification of light sources. So manufacturers today can produce better light sources if they're testing to the TM30 metric and not just the CRI metric. At its very highest level, and we're gonna spend quite a bit of time diving into these three, but at its very highest level, 
The TM30 standard uses fidelity index measured as RF. It uses a gamut index measured as RG. And then the third thing it uses is a color vector graphic. So we've gone from a single CRI metric from zero to 100 to these three core components of the TM30 standard. So TM30 and CRI, I just want to quickly dive into high school art class and really get a, a quick understanding of colors and a quick understanding of uh, the color rendering index as it is used today. And on the left hand side here, you will see these are the 14 color samples that are used. And on the right hand side, I'm just trying to describe here why we use these 14 samples and how CRI is used. So the first thing we have to understand is objects don't have a color, rather they reflect different amounts of energy over that visible light spectrum. So the color we see is from the lack of other colors. So color rendering describes this phenomenon. If I put light on a reference source, how well does that source reflect the colors relative to the sun? So to better understand this, we can go, um, I mentioned to, to our high school art class, and we can look at additive versus subtractive colors. So the colors we see are actually subtractive because the colors that are reflected are what's left by what's absorbed by that actual object. And this concept is known as spectro, sorry, spectroscopy. So we can use that as a reference. A real world example of this would be uh, for anyone in the lighting industry here, take LED grow lights. This is a prime example because horticultural lighting has kind of changed the way we specify LEDs in that world. So if we take LED grow lights used in horticultural production, they need to produce their highest saturation or joules of energy in the red, magenta, blue, and ultraviolet spectrum. And you can see looking at this color wheel, if I look at uh, purple magenta, I look at red, I look at blue, I look at cyan. The reason we know that these plants need this much light or the most amount of energy in this spectrum of the visible light spectrum is because what do they actually reflect? So if light is subtractive, the light we get off leafy plants is green. That means the plant is absorbing all of these other colors and using it as energy. And that's what CRI is based on. How well does your light source reflect these based on the reference source? And here's our 14 samples. And CRI right now only uses 14 samples. So when we're building out that zero to 100 comparative of CRI, we're using these 14 samples that you see here on the left, and we're scoring it as a percentage out of 100 of how well it does compared to our reference. And quickly and simply, this is what CRI is trying to tell you. Here's two objects, and you can see what Drake's preference is. Uh, here's two objects. We have an apple, or sorry, one object, but two different light sources. So on the top, we have a 70 CRI. On the bottom, we have a 95. So you can see on the bottom, it looks a little bit desaturated, a little bit cloudy, or sorry, on the top with the 70 CRI source. And the 95, this is probably what we would want our um, object to look like if we were selling it as a grocer, you know, any products like that. You want to have it visually the most appealing. So typically, you would always go for the highest CRI. And really, that's where CRI ended. 95, 70, well, that's a no-brainer. I'm going to pick a 95 for retail. Okay, 70 CRI, maybe that's okay for stairwells because, um, you know, I can save a little bit of money on the fixture itself because I don't need a higher CRI. There's no value in rendering those colors more accurately. So now let's get into comparing the two. What are the biggest differences between color rendering index and TM30? Well, CRI is fidelity only. I already mentioned that when we looked at this spectral power distribution curve on the bottom. You can see my tungsten halogen. It has a 100% CRI because it does produce all those colors. So if I look at my 14 reference sources, then yes, I'll have a high CRI with regards to that. What this doesn't tell me though is saturation. So how much of each frequency of each light source, or sorry, each color um, how much power from each color is actually getting saturated, and that would be the gamut index. So if we look over here on the right-hand side, here, oops, sorry, I went the wrong way. Here's the comparative. So the first one is, and you'll see that in a moment, but the number of colors. CRI only uses those 14 reference metrics that we looked at. 
TM30 has taken it a step further. There's 99 reference sources. So just as a direct comparative, if we were only using RF or our fidelity in the TM30, it's already gone from 14 to 99 comparative sources. So it's already that much more accurate when compared to traditional CRI. What CRI doesn't do, which I just mentioned, is saturation. So you can see the comparison here. Does CRI reference have any reference or metric to saturation? The answer is no. With TM30, the answer is yes. Is there a spectral uniformity sample comparison with traditional CRI? No. With TM30, we get that, and you'll see that a bit later. Reference transition. CRI is sharp at 5,000 Kelvin. It's a static source. With TM30, it's actually blended between 45 and 5,500 Kelvin because our reference sources vary so much during the day, depending on time of day and different cloud cover and different factors. So now with the TM30 standard, we're capturing that. And the biggest one, and we're going to dive into it, mentioned it before, CRI is only looking at fidelity. Look how many comparatives you get in the TM30 standard. We have a gamut index now, and we have a 16 hue based. Um, chromacity index that allows us to see saturation. And it sounds complicated, but the visual graphical representation of this will make much more sense as, much more sense as we move forward. So that's it. TM30 uses multiple measures and graphics. Now we have not just CRI, we have our fidelity, which would be the closest analogous comparison to CRI. We have RG, which is the gamut index. Then we can take those 16 hue gamut index and we can graphically represent it under the color vector graphic. And there's also sub indices. So that's the comparison. We've gone from a single metric in CRI using 14 references to three metrics within the TM30 standard. And now we'll dive into the value of those standards. So one, let's get into those components in a little more detail. So of the TM30 standard and really the advantages over CRI and how it characterizes light. So we'll look at these three. We're gonna look at fidelity, we'll look at the gamut, and we will look at that color vector graphic. So first, fidelity. Look at the difference from CRI, which we looked at earlier, and now the new fidelity index. So as I mentioned, it is analogous to CRI uses 99 samples, but the beauty of these samples is all the samples were chosen from real world objects. So we're talking nature, skin, textiles, paints, plastic, you know, printed materials, color systems. And then they can be further broken down into those 16 hue bins we'll talk about. So it's a much more demanding index, but RF as a metric is comparable to CRI. So it's from zero to 100. 100 being a direct equivalent to our reference source, the sun. Next, we have the gamut index. And this is where the standard really, you know, we have a more robust fidelity standard now, but gamut is really where we start to differentiate uh, with the TM30 standard. And gamut is a very important index because what we've probably all noticed now over the years, if everyone takes out their cell phone right now and they take a picture of a real world object, before they post that on any social media or before we post that on any social media, we're probably gonna go in and edit or quote unquote enhance that photo. And those enhancements are typically done through light and saturation, desaturation, gamut. You're starting to get into um, some of these adjustments. So why not apply those same principles to the light sources that light our spaces today? And that's what the gamut index really allows you to do. So it complements the fidelity index and it uses 100 as its reference again. The difference now is we can go 40 increments above 100. So I can go as high as 140 on my gamut index or I can come down 40. So I can go as low as 60 on my gamut index. And that number, that RG number, that represents um, the saturation or desaturation. So if I'm above 100, I'm saturated. If I'm below 100, I'm desaturated. What it doesn't tell us is where the saturation is occurring on the chromacity curve, which we will look at in a second. So quickly, let's look at these three versions of the same in image. So here's the original. This light source had a CRI of 95. 
Now that was using the traditional CRI 14 um, test point metric. Let's look at it on the fidelity index. You can actually see it's a bit lower. It's 93 because RF is a more demanding comparison than CRI. And then on the RG, so that gamut scale, saturated, desaturated, we're 100. So up here, this is more than acceptable um, for this application. You can see I'm getting great wash, great colors. You know, there, there's quite a bit of color actually going on in this image. So that's perfect, and that would work most of the time. Now let's compare it to a desaturated source. If I only knew CRI, as you can see here, if I only knew that the CRI was 80, as a specifier, I may say, hey, that's a great CRI. I'm going to go ahead and specify that. With the fidelity index, 78, not too bad, pretty comparable. But what a specifier or anyone choosing that light source for this application would realize is, wow, I'm a bit desaturated here. I don't know what I'm desaturated in, but I might get a washed out effect. And as you can see by the image, that's exactly what you've got here is a washed out wall where colors are becoming desaturated and you're getting that white tone wash on it. Now let's take the exact same scenario and go to a red enhanced or a saturated light source. CRI is the same as the desaturated, fidelity is the same as the desaturated, but there's a big difference here. If I only looked at this CRI 80 versus 80, look at these two images. How can a specifier right now know specifying LED that this 80 CRI was gonna be desaturated and this 80 CRI was gonna be saturated? And the answer is they can't. But if I come down here to the gamut index, I can see, okay, I'm 110, so I'm 10 over on the saturation scale. This one happens to be red enhanced. And you can see visually, users may have a preference for that saturation. And that's really what TM30 starts to identify. So it's hard to understand where I'm saturated or desaturated. And this is the last and probably one of the most important specifier components of the TM30 standard. And that's the color vector graphic. So let's look at that exact same image and let's look at it as a vectored graphic. So I mentioned it before, but now I have 16 hue bins that help me reference um, saturation and I can scale those out on this chromacity graph. So there's 16 points here and in the center of it, that's my reference source, that would be the sun. And then the red line would be my source, my light source, my artificial light source. So you can see in that perfect uh, 100 RG, you can see I almost match perfectly the sun. As I move over to desaturated, now as a specifier or a selector of this product, I can see which colors I'm desaturated in. So now I can start selecting things like blue enhanced, blue desaturated, red enhanced, red desaturated. So I can actually see where that desaturation is occurring. And if I move over here, to the red enhanced, you can see I have more saturation on the red side, which they've proven through research when rendering um, objects, especially in retail. People tend to prefer that red shift. The items become more vibrant, you get more pop. So that really becomes the value. And that's the easiest way for you to visually see the gamut index. So here's the gamut shape again. Here's our 16 hue points with reference to the black line in the center, which would be the sun as a light source. And then you can see where the comparative light source is saturated or desaturated compared to that. So just to finish up here quickly, best values of RF and RG. So RF, the fidelity index is on a scale of one to 100. That's our direct comparison to CRI. RG is on a scale of 60 to 140. 100 is the sweet spot there uh, where it's directly equal to our reference light source. And RF and RG are complemented by the color vector graphic. And this is the easiest way to see which colors are actually saturated or desaturated. So in summary, the TM30 technical memorandum provides an online spreadsheet right now to help calculate and display results. Results includes fidelity, gamut, the color vector graphic. It's very intuitive and it's a very informative tool uh, for us to select light sources and what the tendencies of those light sources are to reveal certain colors as a appearing more vivid to the human eye or more dull to the human eye. You know, for applications such as task lighting where color accuracy was required, you know, maybe a smooth evenly distributed vector chart would be desired. 
in other applications like stairwells, parking garages, well, I can save myself some money because these values aren't as important for that lighting task. And I love this one. Here's another great example from a comparative standpoint. This is actually graphing fidelity and gamut, um, gamut on the y-axis and fidelity on the x-axis. And it's comparing them to other light sources. So you can see in the center here on the far right, here's my halogen where I'm 100 CRI or 100 on the fidelity index. And I'm also 100 on the gamut index. And then we can get into fluorescence and different types of LEDs and where they all stack up when it comes to gamut and fidelity as a comparison. So it's a great, great little tool and it's a great way to visually represent the differences between those light sources. So market impacts as we close. So it's a new way of communicating color rendering performance. It gives lighting designers greater freedom when they're specifying these fixtures. It also makes it possible to custom tailor the color performance of lighting according to the application. The same thing we've seen in the horticultural industry where I can tailor um, saturation uh, energy amounts of different light spectrums. I can also begin to start tuning fixtures for this as I see fit. Uh, with this current CRI metric, there's no way for us to vet out poor LEDs, as you saw by that comparison I showed earlier. Uh, and you can't tell them apart from those that have an enhanced color through saturation and hue shift. And that will all change once we get an adoption of that RF and RG standard. And for specifiers, I just show you this example quickly. Here's a retail display case. Would I want a 90 CRI that's desaturated in red and blue making these food products look dull and boring? It's probably gonna hurt my sales. Or as a specifier, would I select saturations that could color enhance these items in my retail display case, whether it be food, jewelry, or any other items? So really that's it in its simplest value. FAQs, some frequently asked questions. When will I see the standard specified? Well, you may have already seen it and you didn't know it. Um, the standard can be specified now by anyone. It's readily available, as I mentioned earlier. It's on the IES website. It just has not been adopted by ANSI or ISO at this point. Do any manufacturers currently offer this data? The answer is yes. I did a quick Google before I jumped on here. Here's a cut sheet from Cooper. You can find it from Eaton. You can find it from uh, Philips. All the major manufacturers who want to differentiate themselves from those low-cost products coming in you'll see here on this cut sheet i have tm30-15 for all these different products and i can see my fidelity and gamut rankings so it's a great way to differentiate products now and as a specifier to weed out some of the um, products you may not have confidence in is there a guide where I can get recommended best practices for different spaces? The answer to this is yes as well. That TM30-15 is available for download right now on the IES website. Also, you can use the calculator tool at no charge for helping you um, pick the best fixture for the application or task. And finishing up, we always like to thank our manufacturing partners. So on the commercial side for us, that's GLLS, GM Lighting, ICO, and of course, our decorative brands here on the bottom. Thank you so much for joining us, but please get in touch. I encourage everyone to follow us on social media at Catalyst Electrics uh, on Instagram and Facebook. You can check us out on LinkedIn where we try to keep everyone up to date and informed on our new products or information going on within the business. And on the website, catalystsales.ca, there is a webinar section of our website where you can download or view previously recorded versions of this webinar. You can also download the PDF of the presentation to share with colleagues, coworkers, or customers. We encourage you to do that. 